All right, let's open God's Word tonight to Jeremiah chapter 31, if you will, please. Jeremiah chapter number 31. By now we're in the midst of a doctrinal overview of the major themes of the writing prophets as part of our study. And last week we began looking at this um, somewhat intently and I listed out for you the seven prophetic themes that we can identify in the prophets. And I've listed them on the board behind me once again. And of course in the writing prophets we're talking about the section of the Bible that um, is composed of Isaiah to Malachi, right? The prophet Isaiah and running through the end of the commonly called Old Testament, Malachi, those are the writing prophets. And so in that section of the Bible, we've identified these seven prophetic themes. Again, you can divide it up probably and come with come up with more than seven or fewer, depending on how detailed you want to get. But seven prophetic themes that we've identified that if you uh, get a grasp of some of these types of issues, you'll at least know the, the kinds of doctrinal matters that the prophets are dealing with. And so I'm not going to go through all those again. You know, we've got them up here on the board if you want to take your notes um, now or when the service is concluded. Um, and we're not going through each one of these seven, one by one, to look at. We could very easily do that. Uh, but I told you last time that we don't need to do that at this point because we've already covered some of them in previous studies. Um, things like the first installment of the fifth course of punishment there, number one. That's got to do with the captivities. And so when we were coming through the timeline, we looked at some prophetic passages on that, as well as uh, the timeline issue with Daniel 9. And there's some of them that we're going to be looking at as we go on, get on further as it relates to the, the day of the Lord's wrath over here and the, the kingdom of Messiah. That's still out here on the timeline, and we'll get to that when we, we get to it. Uh, but right now we're just looking at a few of these concepts to help prepare us for uh, the gospel period that is rapidly approaching and that we're going to be getting into here within a few weeks. And uh, we started out last week and we looked at the third one here, the details of the new covenant. Right, the writing prophets deal with details of the new covenant for Israel. And uh, started talking about that a little bit. And um, kind of went through some background material last time uh, concerning the need for a new covenant. And we talked about uh, really covenants in God's program with Israel in general. And said a little bit about the Abrahamic covenant and the significance of that. As well as um, the Mosaic covenant comes to be known as the Old Covenant. We mentioned the Palestinian Covenant there in Deuteronomy 29 and 30. And then uh, also the, mentioned the Davidic Covenant briefly. We talked about that in the past and then got to the New Covenant and uh, began looking at how the New Covenant relates in the, the listing of covenants as it relates to Israel. And essentially what the New Covenant is, is it's a divine replacement for the Old Covenant. Right, the Mosaic Covenant, if you the law of Sinai that we've talked so much about at this point. There's a new covenant that God says that he's going to make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And we saw last time that that old covenant or the Mosaic Covenant of Sinai was a covenant that was a covenant for the spiritual fitness of the nation Israel functioning on the land that had been promised to their fathers. Right, they have a they have a calling or a vocation as a nation. God has separated them out from the nations. He's promised them a land, and he's, he takes them to the land, and he's going to plant them there. And They're led in under Joshua back here, and they go in and possess the land on the basis of uh, the old covenant when it comes to their vocational functioning upon that land. They're supposed to be a peculiar treasure unto the Lord, right? a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and to function on Jehovah's behalf as they're dwelling upon that land. And of course, they had come in under Joshua and they were going to supposed to function as Jehovah's people on that land on the basis of the spiritual fitness that they had chosen to try to demonstrate under the Mosaic or Old Covenant. And uh, so they, they go in under that system. But the trouble with that, however, was we saw is that the Mosaic Covenant or the law was a conditional covenant that was dependent upon the natural ability of Israel to perform all the commandments and judgments and statutes of the Lord, and the energy for doing so was the external energy of their flesh. Right? Within the, the law, a man is going to be considered righteous and holy if he does those things. You've got to do the law. 
And it's an attempt to demonstrate natural spiritual fitness. And it was a conditional covenant that if they can do all the commandments of the Lord, they're going to be blessed. Right? The, the Lord's going to tabernacle among them. They'll be his people and he'll be their God if they can keep it all. But if not, the opposite side of that is they experience the chastening and the chastisement ultimately to the point where they lose the possession of the land that the Lord had given them. The Gentiles come in and take it over and they're a byword among the nations, as the law says. And so it was a covenant for spiritual fitness that was conditional based on the performance of the external energy of their flesh. And, uh, I, you know, Israel had signed up for that at Sinai. Exodus 19 again, they say all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We're going to perform it all. We're going to demonstrate that we're naturally spiritually fit to be Jehovah's people and to function according to that calling that he's given us. And so we know how that turned out. They fail miserably under the law. The old covenant does not work out so that they function in righteousness and holiness as Jehovah's people. And they fail to such an extent as we've seen that they lose possession of the land under the chastisements of the Mosaic or Old Covenant, and they end up scattered among the Gentiles, starting with that fifth course of punishment. So they fail. And so it's at the time of their complete failure under the law, and as that has been manifest now by the receipt of all those courses of punishment upon them, it's at this time when they've demonstrated complete failure under the Old Covenant that the Lord now begins to have his prophets speak to them concerning Jehovah's solution for Israel's spiritual unfitness to function in that land. And the solution that the Lord uh, talks to them about is this new covenant. And so it's in view of their failures under the law that the prophets begin holding before the nation the hope of the new covenant. Right, there's a grace that is to be brought unto them when the Messiah appears. And the hope of the new covenant begins to be spoken about there by the prophets. And, and that's the, the solution to all of Israel's spiritual unfitness that they've demonstrated naturally under the old covenant. And the reason that that is a solution that will work is because the new covenant promises spiritual fitness for Israel. But it's not a spiritual fitness that's going to be produced by the efforts and energy of their own flesh but it's going to be produced by the act of God's spirit to internalize the law, to take that law, as he'll say, and write it on their hearts. And then they're going to be given the spiritual capacity and supernaturally cause to walk in his ways. The energy of the flesh and Jehovah's spirit is going to write the law in their hearts and cause them to walk in his ways. And through the power of the spirit, rather than the power of the flesh, they're going to have a different outcome. Right? He is going to make them spiritually fit to finally be able to function upon that land as the kingdom of priests and holy nation that he's called them to be as his people. And so as that is the, the doctrinal gist of what we're talking about in the new covenant here, I want to take those concepts that we talked about last night and begin to develop that a little bit and look at some passages in the prophets tonight specifically that are given for Israel's edification in this new covenant doctrine. Okay. And we're not going to look at all the passages by any means that the prophets deal with, but just a select grouping of passages that we're going to see a number of pro in a number of prophets where we're going to see that terminology coming up and then talking about these things that we tried to go over and set the table for last time. And so Jeremiah chapter 31, if you've got your pass, uh, place there, again, we read this at the end last time. This is the hallmark passage, if you will, on the new covenant and where we pick up that terminology, new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The Bible says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Right, so in this passage, we see that terminology, new covenant, don't we? Jeremiah, of course, is a writing prophet. He's one of these prophets that we're talking about. 
Jeremiah, by the Spirit of God, is giving Israel details of a new covenant that the Lord says that he's going to be making with them. Now, Jeremiah, specifically in the grouping of the prophets, he's what we refer to as a first installment prophet. Okay, So what that means is that Jeremiah is raised up and he's ministering in view of the arrival of that fifth course of punishment. Right, The Babylonians are on their way to the land to haul them off into captivity when Jeremiah is ministering. And he'll be there when Nebuchadnezzar comes, and a little while after that, he's ministering among the people, and he's talking about details of their captivity, of course, and that, that start and the arrival of the fifth course of punishment. But in connection with that now, he's looking out, he's looking back, really, at their failures under the old covenant, and he's looking forward to the hope that's out there at the end for them, which is in this new covenant that he's describing here in Jeremiah chapter 31. The Lord, through Jeremiah, is speaking of a new covenant. And you notice that as he says there in verse 31, he's going to make a new covenant. And this new covenant, he's careful to point out, is with the same nation that had received the old covenant. All right, verse 31 again. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with who? With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. All right, that's, that's talking about those two houses of Israel, this divided kingdom concept that we've talked about. Israel is the northern kingdom. There were ten tribes up there. Judah is the southern kingdom. There was two tribes down there. So in total, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, ten and two, make up the twelve tribes of the complete nation. Right? And he's saying to this nation, right, this nation of Israel, my people, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. That's the same people that got the old covenant back here at Sinai. We're talking about a specific people, a specific nation. And he's careful to point that out here. He's making a new covenant with the same people that he had uh, made the old covenant with with their fathers when he had brought them out of Egypt. Now this new covenant is not going to be based on the same power as the old covenant. But its function is the same in the sense that both are covenants for spiritual fitness and the ability of Israel to function as Jehovah's people on that land to accomplish his purpose but the key difference between the Old and the New Covenant is that the Old Covenant was dependent upon the energy of their flesh to perform it, whereas this New Covenant is going to, be a, uh, it's going to re- come with a spiritual power that's going to enable them to, to walk in His ways. The Lord's careful here when He makes this New Covenant to point out that this New Covenant is not going to be like the Old Covenant. He says that it's not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. I made a covenant with them back there at Sinai. I brought them out of Egypt, brought them to Sinai, and we made a covenant there, a covenant for you to demonstrate your natural spiritual fitness by doing all the law. And what you did from that place forward is you fail and you failed and you failed over and over and over again. So that covenant, as far as you ever functioning in that land for my purpose as my people, that That's a dead issue with the Lord. Making a covenant like that again is going to end up in the same same result of destruction because there's an infirmity in the flesh of the people. There's nothing wrong with the law. That law is holy and just and good. Paul will come along and tell us. Nothing defective about the law. The the defect is in the people. The flesh of the people. They've got a sin problem. And they have no natural capacity to measure up to Jehovah's righteous and holy standard. And so Jehovah says, you know, you failed under that system with me letting you try to do it on your own and demonstrate what you thought you naturally possessed in righteousness and holiness. That failed, as is evidenced by the fact that you're losing the land and going into Gentile captivity. But I'm going to make a new covenant with you that's not according to that. There's going to be a different power in the new covenant that addresses the faults of the old, as it were, right? the fault in your flesh in relation to the old. And so this is a covenant that operates upon a different power. He said that old covenant system, he says, which my covenant they break. That's all they ever did under the old covenant. They need something else if they ever have any hope of functioning as his kingdom of priests and holy nation. The external efforts of the flesh to perform the righteousness of the law had utterly failed with Israel. Israel has ended up cast out under that system, losing their land to the Gentiles, and they've demonstrated that they will never function as his people under a conditional covenant for spiritual fitness that's based upon their own ability. 
They desperately need a new covenant, don't they? They need a new power. They need a, they need a better covenant, if you will. A better covenant that's based on better promises that's going to produce a better outcome. And the new covenant does that. Because it's not a covenant that's based on their flesh. It's going to be a covenant that is based upon the name of the Lord providing spiritual fitness for them. The Lord functioning in their stead, coming and identifying with them as his people, right? Perfectly observing and keeping that law that they failed at, and then going to lay down his life to perform the redemption of Israel from their lawful captivity that we've talked about in weeks past and provide the blood of the New Testament or the new covenant whereby spiritual fitness can That's the power and source of the new covenant. And that's what they need. And that's what the Lord provides and what he promises for them in this new covenant. As we look at the details of exactly what this covenant promises now, if you cast your eyes down to verse 33 of our passage here once again, he starts giving the details of what this covenant covenant's for. And he says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. They shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. And I will remember their sin no more. Now those two verses are laying out the details of the new covenant. And there's about five things that you can identify there that the Lord is promising to do on Israel's behalf as it relates to their spiritual fitness. Five things that he mentions here. And he mentions these things in the direction of God to man. I would have you know too that these five things are all spiritual things. Like the new covenant is not covenanting for physical land. Okay, It's not promising the land. The Abrahamic covenant's already done that. So it's not promising them land. It's not promising them a, a kingdom or a throne. The Davidic covenant promises that. But the new covenant here is it's promising only spiritual things. This is about their spiritual fitness to be able to function as his people, according to a calling. It's dealing with inner man issues. You pick up on that as you just read it there. He says that I will put my law in their inward parts. So this is the inward issue that he's talking about. An inner man job, a spiritual thing. You see, It's promising them spiritual things. Now spiritual doesn't mean unreal. And sometimes you, people, they think when you use the word spiritual, you mean not real. It's not that it's not real. These are all very real things. It's just inner man issues. And that's a, key, that's a key contrast with that old covenant, right? This is external. This tells you what to do and what's right, but it doesn't, it doesn't give you any power to do it. It's relying upon the external energy of your flesh to go and perform its righteousness. That's external back there under the old covenant. Kind of like father and son. Father Amen. tells the son about children, speaking about children now, the new covenant. My son. True. That's true. But the old covenant is relying upon the energy of their flesh. The new covenant's an inward job. Not your fleshly energy, but I'm going to put that law with its righteousness and its holiness, I'm going to put it on your inward parts, an inside job that this new covenant's going to bring. And so he says, I'm going to put my law in your inward parts and write it on your hearts. The Spirit of God is the one that writes it on the heart, the power of the Spirit. The next thing he says is, I will be their God and they shall be my people. So that, that's what the whole thing's about, them functioning that way. A peculiar treasure unto the Lord. What, what the law promised them, if they could do it all, if they could demonstrate natural spiritual fitness by the energy of their flesh, he said, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. But they failed and he ends up treating them like they're not his people. They get cast out. But he says, well, the new covenant, what this is going to supply is for the ability for you to function as my people and I will be your God. It's going to accomplish my vocational objective with you as a people and as a nation. And then he says that another thing he's going to provide for is that they shall all know me. They're going to know the Lord. They're not going to have need to be taught one of another, but he says that they shall all know me. 
They're going to know Jehovah. Come to trust and believe and, and, and realize what that name implies about him. And, and to know that the reason they have spiritual fitness is not because of us, but it's because of him. You're going to know my name. Be able to function as my people. He says also that I will forgive their iniquity. Number four. And then number five, I will remember their sins no more. Five things, spiritual things, that the new covenant is promising. Now, in my understanding of this covenant and these inner man issues that he's talking about here, these five things that he's talk, talking about can be divided up into two categories of things. The first category is made up of the first three. The second category is made up of the last two. And these two categories comprise what we've been referring to over the last several weeks as this issue of spiritual fitness. Spiritual fitness. Again, the orders from God to man, because the first three components he lists there deal with issues of sanctification. The end goal of sanctification. The final two there with the forgiveness of their iniquity and the remembrance of their sin no more, those two deal with justification. So you can divide the five up into two categories. He's talking about sanctification issues and he's talking about justification issues. Those are the two components of spiritual fitness. Okay, And he talks about the sanctification issue first and then the justification issue because, again, he's talking about this from the direction of God to man. Right? When man approaches God, it's in the reverse order. We have to be justified first, and then we become sanctified as we move toward God's purpose. But when God's looking at it, he's looking at it in the, in the reverse order. So he's talking about sanctification issues with those first three. Writing his law on their hearts, being their God, they being his people, knowing the Lord, sanctification issues for them as a nation, and then justification issues, the forgiveness of sin, the remembrance of their iniquities no more. But ultimately, he's talking about justification and sanctification as the components of what they need for spiritual fitness. Justification has to do with righteousness. Sanctification has to do with holiness. And being set apart for God's use. Perfect righteousness and perfect holiness. Did you know that a person has to have both of those categories of spiritual fitness before the Lord can ever use them in accordance with a vocation or a calling? Right? If somebody's going to be used of God according to his purpose, they've got to they've got Perfect righteousness and holiness of God. You've got to qualify to be used for him. And the way you're going to be qualified to be used in a vocational calling for him is you've got to have perfect righteousness and you've got to have perfect holiness. If you don't have perfect righteousness, that's not compatible with the perfect righteousness of God. If you don't have perfect holiness, that's not compatible with the perfect holiness of God. That's the baseline standard. Before God is going to do and can do anything else with you, you've got to have spiritual fitness to function that way. Yeah. That's why back here when he was taking them into the land, before they go in there, we've got to settle how this issue of spiritual fitness is going to be dealt with. I want you to be my peculiar treasure. I want you to be my kingdom of priests and holy nation and function according to my calling for you in that land. But on the old covenant, they said, we're going to do it. Yeah. We're going to demonstrate that we naturally already possess those things. We're already perfectly righteous and fit for your use. We're already perfectly holy. We can function as your people in that land because we're already good enough. We don't need the Lord. We're naturally righteous. We're naturally holy. God says, all right, let's do it the hard way. And they go through that process of having to learn the hard way that you're not naturally righteous. You're not naturally holy. You're not spiritually fit in your natural state. You're actually right the opposite. You're spiritually unfit. And you're no better than the Gentiles because you've got a sin problem. So under the old covenant, they never could attain or prove that they were naturally what they said they were. Therefore, the only solution, if they're ever going to function according to their calling in a kingdom in the midst of that land, is that Jehovah does something for them, right? 
And an act of the grace of Jehovah implementing His name on their behalf to do some things for them. And that's what the new covenant's all about. I'm going to do these things for you. Because you're not naturally holy and you're not naturally righteous, I'm going to undertake to do some things for you. I'm going to internalize the law and write it on your heart. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. You'll know the Lord. Have no need that any man teach you. I'm going to forgive all your iniquities and remember your sins no more. I'm going to provide spiritual fitness for you. Perfect justification and perfect sanctification on the basis of the new covenant so that once, once that's dealt with and you're spiritually fit to function, you can actually go in there and do what I've called you to do in connection with the earth. That's their vocation. Right? That, that's what they've been called unto in the purpose of God. So the new covenant is providing for that. Again, it's great that the Abrahamic covenant promises them land. It's great that the Davidic covenant promises them a king, a kingdom, and a throne. That is the purpose of God for them on the earth. All that's wonderful. But if they're not spiritually fit to function in that land and carry out the purpose of Messiah's kingdom when he's there, it's all for nothing. They've got to have the spiritual fitness to even qualify for God's intended purpose of them. And the new covenant is what's promising that to them through the work of God and not the work of their flesh. And so that's what the new covenant promises and provides for by internalizing the law and providing spiritual power to fulfill the righteousness of it. I come back to chapter 24 of Jeremiah. Just going to hop through a few passages here in the remainder of our time in the prophets and see these concepts kind of worked out. Jeremiah 24, beginning in verse 4. Scripture says, Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place, into the land of the Chaldeans, for their good. Now realize, verse 5 there, he's describing what state they're in as they're facing the arrival of this fifth course of punishment. The Chaldeans or the Babylonians are coming to take them away captive. They're being removed from off the land, going into the, the lands of their enemies for a time of captivity. And the Lord is acknowledging that, and he's he's saying, and he said through Jeremiah, that this is coming to them. This is what they're about to experience. Yet he says that he's going to acknowledge them for their good. They're going to be carried away, but there's going to be a time when he acknowledges them for their good. And he does them good. Despite what they have merited under the old covenant. Despite what they deserve, Jehovah is still going to acknowledge them and do some things for them to bring them back. Verse 6, he says, For I will set mine eyes upon them for good. And I will bring them again to this land and I will build them and not pull them down and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Well, that's what had happened to them under the old covenant. It was conditional. Blessings for obedience, cursing for disobedience. They were disobedient, stiff-necked, therefore they were plucked up and they were thrown down. But he's going to bring them back and he's going to do some things for them so that it's not, they don't have that outcome. They're built up and they're planted and not plucked up. Verse 7, why is that going to be the case? And why is it going to work differently the next time? He says in verse 7, And I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. So he's going to bring them back into the land after their captivity, and he's going to do some things for them there where he says, I will give them a heart to know me. That's what they didn't have back here. They didn't have a heart to know him. They didn't have a heart that was inclined to his ways. Instead, they could have turned quickly out of the way. Right the opposite of everything he said. He says, I'm going to give them a heart to know me, right? I'm going, to, I'm going to put my law in their inward parts. They're going to have no need that a man teach them because they're going to know me, as Jeremiah 31 says. They're going to know me. And what is it that they know of me, verse 7? He says, that I am the Lord. Jehovah, 
They're going to come to an understanding of what that name means, right? And that, that name is the only way that they ever can have spiritual fitness. The implementation of the name of Jehovah that we've talked so much about all through the program. When it comes to that new covenant and the internalizing of the law, they're going to know that I'm the Lord. They're going to know the power of Jehovah's and grace functioning to provide for them what they never could provide by the energy of their flesh. That's what they're going to know. He's going to give them a new heart. They're going to know at that point that the name of the Lord that they rejected back here at Sinai is the only way they ever function according to their calling. They're going to know that the name of the Lord that they spurned time and time and time again all through the courses of punishment up to the captivities, that that name is the only name whereby they'll ever be made spiritually fit. They're going to be a people that come to know that it's not unto us, right? Not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, O Lord. That's what they're going to come to understand. The power of the Lord and his spirit doing these things for them. Jump over to chapter 32 of Jeremiah. Another similar pattern, right? In all these passages, you see a similar pattern here where he talks about their failures under the old covenant that's getting them kicked out of the land at the captivity. But the Lord's going to bring them back and he's going to do some things for them where they can function according to that calling. That's the pattern. Look here, uh, Jeremiah 32, verse 36. 32, 36. He says, And now therefore thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, whereof you say it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Fifth course of punishment, the captivities, what he's been prophesying about. Verse 37, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath and will bring them again unto this place and cause them to dwell safely. They're getting kicked out of the land when the prophet's prophesying, but he's going to bring them back and he's going to do some things to produce a different outcome where they dwell safely. They're not plucked up off that land. Verse 38, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, and they shall not depart from me. Right, See, so when this happens, they're not going to depart from They're caused to walk in his ways. Verse 41, Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. Now that last phrase there, verse 41, the Lord says he's going to plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. Not their whole heart and whole soul, Mine, Jehovah's, right? Back here, weren't they commanded you to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength? That's what the Lord required of them, and they didn't. They didn't do it with their whole heart. They couldn't do it with their whole heart because their, their heart was bent toward evil. But in the new covenant, the Lord says, I'm going to plant them on that land. I'm going to give them spiritual fitness according to my heart and my soul. Jehovah functioning do it for them. An everlasting covenant. It's going to make it so that when they go into that land, the basis of their functioning is on a new covenant, on a new power. It's not sourced in their flesh, but sourced in the name of the Lord. And that's why they'll be able to function as a kingdom of priests and holy nation out there when it's done. All right, let's jump over to Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, again, passage that we touched quickly at the end last week. See the same pattern here, the same flow of information in view of their coming captivities at the time when Ezekiel's ministering. Uh, back up to verse 16 here of Ezekiel 36, laying out their present condition. Ezekiel 36, 16, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, 
They defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore, I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. As the chastisements of the law that the Lord brings upon them at the captivities. Start of the fifth course of punishment. Jump down to verse 24. After they're scattered among the heathen, he says, verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. He's going to bring them back. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. It's a cleansing process. In verse 26, he says, A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Right? It's a new heart he's giving them and putting his spirit within them that's causing them to do these things. It's a different power in the new covenant. That comes that the outcome of which is a new result. They're able to function as his people. Verse 28, And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. See, the capacity for them to function in that land as Jehovah's people rests upon the provisions of a new covenant to give them a new heart, a new spirit, a new power for spiritual fitness. See the pattern over and over and over again. Hosea chapter 1. Another writing prophet here. Hosea chapter 1. Here, Hosea chapter 1. We've read this passage before. You know that the Lord actually commands Hosea to go and take a wife of whoredoms there in verse 2. Bizarre thing. The Lord commands the prophet, but he's doing that to give Israel a picture of what they've done in relation to him. Right? They've been unfaithful. They've played the harlot, as he said, with their idols. And so he's given a picture lesson to Israel through his prophet here. And so Hosea takes this uh, wife, Gomer, and she bears him children. And, and as the children are born, the Lord tells them to call their names specific things to give a message to the nation. And he talks about Jezreel in connection with their coming captivity there in verse 4 and 5. And then if you pick up in verse 6, you've got another conception here of Hosea and Gomer. Verse 6 says, And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name Lo-Rahama. Why? He says, For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I'll have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horse, nor by horsemen. So he has Hosea call this daughter of his Lo Rahama. It means no mercy. And he says, I want you to name her that because I, Jehovah, will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. He'd been merciful to them all through this time in the land. But they've become worthy of the fifth course of punishment. No more mercy. The captivities are coming and they're going to be cast out. No more mercy upon them. Verse 8. Now when she had weaned Lorahama, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, uh, then said God call his name Loami. Why? For ye are not my people and I will not be your God. You're not my people, and I will not be your God. We talked about that phrase when we were coming up to the fifth course of punishment. That, that essentially means that he's going to treat them as though they're not his people, right? Instead of, like when they came in, Israel drove out the Gentiles when he brought them in. Over here, that situation is flipped around, and it's the Gentiles that's going to be driving them out of the land. They're no longer going to be in there to function as his people. 
that kingdom calling that they have cannot function on the basis of the old covenant. They're not qualified for it. And so he puts them in a status here and he says, you're not my people and I will not be your God. You didn't qualify yourself for that function under the old covenant. Verse 10, he says, yet, right? <laughs> there's still hope despite their failures, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. He's talking about a complete reversal of this situation he's just pronounced on him, isn't he? He's not saying you're not my people in the sense that I'm all done with you and, and my purpose with you is, is crashed and, and you know that we're never going to accomplish it. It's for a period of time where I'm going to be treating you like you're not my people because you can't function that way under the old covenant. But I am going to do some things with a new covenant whereby it's going to be said to those people there where they he said that you're not my people. It shall be said to those same people, ye are the sons of the living God. And that concept of being a son is founded upon being spiritually fit for Jehovah's use. And a son serves the father in the father's business. There's a vocation attached to that. An apprenticeship, if you will, where the father's bringing up his son and, and, and training him and teaching him to know his ways and his thoughts and his a manner of being and having the son go out and to labor in that business to accomplish his purpose. There's an adoption concept in that. You're going to be called the sons of the living God. But it's not according to the old covenant. It's been according to this new covenant because it provides for spiritual fitness. Amen. You'll be called the sons of the living God. If you skip over into chapter 2, he says a similar thing again to them. Chapter 2, pick up in verse 17. He's talking about this cleansing process once again. And he says, For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of the heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. And I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass, in that day I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. The new covenant puts Israel in a position where they actually can function according to their calling and their vocation as the sons that he's called them to be. All right? Hopefully you can see in those passages, right? Those passages, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea now, writing prophets, that's what we're looking at. In those writing prophets, they're dealing with this theme of the new covenant for Israel and what it means and what it brings. And there's other passages on this, right? In the prophets, this is not all of them by any means, but several key passages where you see this, this repeated pattern of doctrine talked about, right? It's, it's a prophetic theme. They're looping through and giving more details each time you go through it to expound this new covenant for Israel and what it's going to mean for them. Dealing with their spiritual fitness that gives them the capacity to function upon the land as Jehovah's people, according to an earthly kingdom calling that the Lord has for them. Okay? Now, one more passage. We'll close with this. Come back with me to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Isaiah is another writing prophet, of course. And I bring you to this passage because I think that this is a good passage to look at that kind of ties together this concept of the new covenant providing for spiritual fitness and that qualifying them to function in that land in a kingdom as they've been called for. Right? So spiritual fitness qualifying them to function in a vocation. And you kind of see these concepts of a spiritual covenant that the Messiah is bringing with um, the, the uh, 
the earthly kingdom that they're called into. And so we'll read here in Isaiah 61, verse number one. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to claim, uh, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them the uh, beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And he's talking about the ministry of the Messiah here, what, what the Messiah brings. The spirit of the Lord is upon him to begin proclaiming hope to Israel when he comes. It looks like they're in a state of hopelessness all through this time, right? And in this third course of punishment that we're dealing with, there's a long span of years where they're not hearing at all from God. There's many that are, as he says, uh, brokenhearted because of the chastisements and the curses of the law the nation's experiencing. They're captives, bound in prison, no joy as it were. And yet the Messiah comes when he shows up over here He's going to be proclaiming some things. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him to proclaim some things, some glad tidings of comfort in relation to a gospel of the kingdom. And the Messiah is going to bring the good hope of the, the grace that's to be brought unto them in a new covenant when you get to that gospel period. He's preaching this, giving them this hope and what lay ahead for them. And he's preaching these, these issues, these spiritual issues of the new covenant and what it's providing for and what it's bringing to the nation. Why? Latter part of verse 3 there. He says, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Hmm. Trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. It's going to make them righteous in justification. It's going to make them sanctified or holy and they plant it in that land to function according to his purpose and it's all going to result in the glory of the Lord and what he's intended for them in a vocation and a walk. Verse 4, they shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations and shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And the strangers shall stand and feed your flocks and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. And that's the Gentiles. They'll be Israel servants. They're not cutting over here, right? When the captivity's coming, the Gentiles are trodden them under feet. The Gentiles are above and Israel's beneath, but in the kingdom, Israel's exalted. And those Gentiles are their servants to do these, these uh, tasks of uh, husbandry and, and the plowmen and so forth that he's talking about there. That's what the Gentiles are going to be doing, those functions. He says in verse 6, but ye, Israel, right? The nation of the Lord, ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. See, they're going to be doing the husbandry and the planting, and your servants to do these things. You're going to be called the priests of the Lord, ministers of righteousness. You're going to have a vocation in that land to make known the name of the Lord in the midst of the earth. Verse 7, he says, For your shame ye shall have double. There's a blessing. And for confusion they shall... Uh, Excuse me, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels, for as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations." What he read in Luke. After Absolutely. He was 40 days and 40 nights. Amen. He started his ministry. He went and opened the book. Amen. Absolutely. That's what he read. Yes. This is what's happening right now. Yep. Messiah comes preaching the comforting hope 
of the glad tidings of the gospel of the kingdom for Israel. Right? Talking about the new covenant. What he's bringing. What he's going to provide for. What that's going to spell for Israel. Finally being able to go into the kingdom. And function according to their calling. Amen. Absolutely. So that's the details of the new covenant. And the prophets. You said you read about double portions. Is that another kind of thing? Yep. Job got double portions. Yep. Absolutely. Double. Definite parallel. Yeah. Yep. The latter end of Job, right? The Lord gives him double. It's the connection he was making there. And for their trouble, he says that they're going to possess the double, right? Top of the kingdom, for sure. Amen. That's details of the new covenant. The prophets clearly talk about that in these passages we've looked at Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, and a host of others. But that's a prophetic theme that you find in the prophets. Amen. Amen. Let's close in prayer tonight. Thank you for your attention. Our God and Father, we do thank you for these things. We thank you for these truths of the new covenant that we can study in your word and uh, see these passages in the prophets. Fascinating topic to look at and one that um, is very relevant um, for us as we consider these spiritual things of justification and sanctification. And uh, we just uh, thank you for making these things known to us and preserving them in your word so that we can study them together. I thank you for these saints that have come out and uh, demonstrated a, a heart of love for your word and a desire to know it more and more week by week. We thank you for them. We pray for the furtherance of their edification and for the comfort of the saints that are uh, bereaved and not with us this evening. Again, we give you the thanks and the praise for the honor and glory of Christ. His name. Amen.